good morning, everyone, and welcome to our transportation session of the 2013 Solutions Summit here in the Tri-Cities. Uh, I'm Bob Pishu, the director of the Center for Transportation, and this morning we'll be focusing on a number of things, including the importance of inf infrastructure in Washington's transportation system. We'll have a chance to hear from Dr. Ronald Utt, formerly of the Heritage Foundation, and State Senator Doug Erickson, who sits on the Senate Transportation Committee. First, we want to recognize our co-presenter this morning, the Greater Yakima Chamber of Commerce. And just a reminder, publications and our speakers' PowerPoints will be available on our website uh, in our online folder. The center is currently working on a number of projects. Uh, certain policies exist that unnecessarily increase the cost of building roads in our state. Also, future studies will focusing on leveraging private dollars for public projects, and we'll look at other states' successes and failures with expanding public-private partnerships. WPC recently commissioned a poll uh, to see what the public uh, thinks about transportation policy in our state. So the first question we asked was, how important to you personally is, is it for government officials to reduce traffic congestion or reduce travel times? 58% of people said it was extremely or fairly important. That contrasts with this question. Thinking about the government's role in transportation, how would you rate public officials' performance on relieving congestion? Even more, 63% uh, said not so good or poor. We also asked when spending your tax dollars, which one of the following should state government's most important, or should be state government's most important transportation priority? Uh, a plurality said maintaining existing highways and bridges and uh, also adding lanes uh, to fix traffic choke points. We also asked which one of the following would you be most likely to support for pay for more projects? A plurality, 41% uh, said reforms that reduce the cost of building and repairing roads. 20% said a gas tax increase, 19% said a yearly tax on your car's value. And also, uh, State lawmakers are considering a new state level tax to fund local transit service while keeping local taxes in place. Would you support or oppose this new tax? So state level funding for local transit. Uh, currently local bus agencies are funded through local taxes. Uh, a large percentage said oppose, 48% with 37% supporting. So a big discrepancy there. So uh, first uh, I'd like to introduce our uh, first speaker. Uh, Senator Doug Erickson represents the 42nd district and, uh, consisting of the northwest corner of the state. He chairs the Energy, Environment, and Telecommunications Committee. He also serves on Health Care, Transportation, and Rules Committee. Uh, please extend a warm welcome to our first uh, speaker, Senator Doug Erickson. Thank you all for the chance to be here today, and I will keep my, no PowerPoint presentation for me. You just have to listen to me for a couple minutes as I set it up. But it, it's a pleasure to be here in the Tri-Cities with you today um, to serve in the Senate and be here on these important issues. First off, I'd like to go back to where I was when I was in the House of Representatives in 2003. In 2003, Washington State passed a five-cent gas tax increase, and I was the ranking Republican on the Transportation Committee at that particular time. And I'd like to let people know I'm the only surviving Republican who has been the chair or, or ranking member when a gas tax uh, package has passed the legislature. Every other Republican lead was asked by their voters not to come back to Olympia. Um, and why is that? Uh, in 2003, what we focused in on were reforms and solutions for how we could have a better transportation package that would actually build roads in Washington State. So today, what I really want to talk about in setting up uh, our next speaker is the language we use about transportation, how we talk about it. Because today, we're here to talk about solutions. And how you define the problem is how you define the solution. And then we can't forget that when we come into the legislative session and into the, into the transportation negotiations. How you define the problem is how we will define the solution going forward. The other item we need to be looking at is what will be the narrative on transportation that the media and the public will talk about. So when you go into a legislative session, there's always a narrative that the media has that is their preconceived notion of how things will play out, what they want to write about, what will be the stories and they put it all into that same template. So as we go into the next legislative session, our next special session, who knows what it'll be here in, in Washington State, what's gonna be the narrative? Is the narrative going to be you know, raising gas taxes to build more projects, or is the narrative going to be how can I reform the system to build more projects? 
Why is it in Washington State we're 40 percent more to build a road project than in other states around the country? You know, what are the cost drivers we need to address to stretch those dollars out to build more programs all throughout Washington State? So that's going to be the, the key element, I believe, coming into the upcoming uh, transportation negotiations is how you define it. Um, one of the issues we'll be talking about is mega waste on mega projects. And when you come to places like the Tri-Cities or over to Walla Walla or to Spokane or up into the Bellingham area where there aren't enough tax dollars to pay for projects and yet we have cost overruns on mega projects that to total into the hundreds of millions of dollars, we need to address those situations. And what is great about what's happening here in the Tri-Cities and what's happening through the Policy Center is helping to define the narrative, helping to define the problem when it comes to transportation. Uh, when I was in the House, I also served as the floor leader. And at that particular time, we were in the deep, dark minority in the House. And really, all you could do was try and shape the issue from the minority. But we also got to the point of saying, you can't be no unless you have a better solution. You have to be able to finish the sentence saying, I don't like mega waste on mega projects, but I have to finish the sentence with the solution. How do I combat the waste on those projects? What are the solutions to change the direction that we're currently going in Washington State? And that's why with the Majority Coalition Caucus, what we're focusing in on are the reforms that will change the direction of how we build these projects so we have dollars available to build not only a 520 bridge, a 405 in Seattle, but how we take care of the projects in all four corners of Washington State. Because business as usual, is not going to allow us to build the projects that we need. The other aspect when it comes to solutions and defining the problem, the public isn't going to go out and simply support a 10 and a half or 11 cent or a 12 cent gas tax increase at the ballot. And I think most people here understand no matter what we do in Olympia, the people will have their say, whether it's a referendum directly to the people or if the people have to go out and gather the signatures to be able to support that, to have a vote on that particular tax increase. So the more that we do on the solution front, the more chances there are to get the people to support a tax increase if that's what we decide to do. But at the same time, the more we do on the reform front, the lower the tax increase has to be that we ask for. And so that's what we have to be focused in on. So one of the things that we're working hard to do in our reform package right now is to assess or, or, or assign a value to each individual reform that we're offering up in Washington State and then equate it to a gas tax increase. I'll give you my favorite example, which is a sales tax on transportation projects. Um, everybody says, yeah, why are we charging ourselves sales tax? But I, I'd like to compromise in the spirit of bipartisanship and cooperation. I believe we should just exempt sales tax on bonded projects. And so when we go out to bond a project based upon the interest rates, the overall cost of that sales tax for the life of that project equates to about 13 to 14 percent of the overall cost once you bond the sales tax. And so when people say we don't borrow money to fund our general fund in Washington State, we do every year. We go out and we take transportation gas tax dollars, we put in the general fund, and then we pay it off with bonds over the next 25 years, driving up the cost of these projects ridiculously. So just bonded projects. Let's not charge sales tax on those. There's a great solution for us. Let's reform permitting system in Washington State. So when the Skagit River Bridge fell into the, uh, into the Skagit River on I-5, um, people looked at that and said, there is the reason why we have to go out and raise taxes immediately. I looked at that project and I said, let's take a look at what happened here in the Skagit River. Terrible tragedy, bridge collapses, thank goodness nobody was killed or seriously injured. Think about the miracle of that. A bridge with 73,000 uh, 73, trips over a day and ridiculous amount of people every day collapses into the river and nobody's killed. Now that right there is a miracle. Um, but we look at what happened on the Skagit River Bridge. We didn't raise a single tax. We're in the water working within one week. And that project came in in half the time and half the cost originally estimated by the Department of Transportation. So what happened? We have great people at the DOT. And as we talk about the issue, we need to change our language from saying that the DOT are the bad people that are doing things so terribly. We have a lot of great engineers and great people. And what we saw on the Skagit River Bridge, when we tell the DOT and our very talented contractors to get the job done, they get it done on time and under budget. And that's the type of permitting system we need to apply statewide. And one of the things on environmental permitting, my master's degree is in environmental policy and I chair the Environment Committee. And when you talk about a road project in Washington State, I can do a project in six months or six years, the environmental impacts will be the same, right? I know what I'm going to do. We have best agreed to standards. We can go out and apply those in six weeks. It shouldn't take six years to get to fruition on these projects. And we save money on that side of the project also. So as we go forward, I think one of the problems we're going to face is that cost savings requires cost spending. And so I can save all the money I want, 
but you have to spend money to get there. And one of the problems we've had in Olympia over the past 10 years is we bond our gas tax too highly. And so now we fall off a cliff. All the money is spent and now we're paying off those dollars. But what I want to stress today, as we control the narrative, I can reform the system tomorrow and I can not charge sales tax, I can do permit streamlining, I can address some of our labor issues, I can make the ferry system more affordable in terms of how we build our ferries, but I can't recapture the dollar I bonded yesterday. That dollar is out the door, and that's why it is so crucial, so crucial that we reform the system first so I can put those dollars to good use. And if we can't get that done, I can't go and ask the people of the 42nd district to pay a higher tax to pay for projects that we're going to waste more money on. Mega waste on mega projects is not an exaggeration when you look at the numbers we've wasted on studies of the Columbia River crossing, for example. When you look at pontoons that won't float on the, uh, or sink, or whatever they're supposed to do, they do the opposite of, on the 520 bridge, and the state is on the hook for that because we didn't go out and use a design build process with the, with the contractor that would have placed the risk on the contractor instead of placing the risk on the state of Washington. There are so many things that we can do, from the big one, 13% for sales tax, to the small one of saying when we do permitting in Washington State, we won't hold up a project because a permit is being challenged on an environmental basis, but we'll move forward with it and save you dollars. So going into Olympia this next year, or in this next special session, whatever, whatever it'll be, it'll be, um, we have to control the narrative. We have to control the language, and we have to focus in on the solutions. And I cannot stress enough that how you define the problem is how you define the solution to the issues that we face in Washington State. We need to build more roads, we need to add capacity, we need to make those investments to maintain our aging infrastructure, but at the same time we have to use those dollars effectively and efficiently because we cannot continually go back to the people of Washington State and ask for more and more money to be put into a system that many people see every single day um, is not working properly and money is being wasted. So with that, I, I appreciate what you're doing. Um, I'm trying to be optimistic on it. I'm trying to be uh, clear on what we're trying to do. And hopefully in Olympia, we'll have the courage to actually um, move forward on the need to reforms that need to happen in Washington State to use your dollars more effectively. With that, great to be here. I look forward to questions about what we need to do to uh, keep Washington State moving forward in this arena. Thank you so much for the chance today. Uh, thank you, Senator. I, I forgot to mention, we'll just hold the Q&A until uh, after both speakers um, have given their presentation. So our, for our next speaker, uh, Dr. Ron Utt is a former senior, fe is a former senior fellow uh, at the Heritage Foundation. There, Dr. Utt focused on research in, in areas of urban revitalization, land use, transportation, housing, and federal budget issues. Uh, he has recently authored a book about the War of 1812 uh, called Ships of Oak, Guns of Iron. Uh, please extend a warm welcome to our uh, speaker, Dr. Ronald Dutt. Uh, thank you very much, Bob, for uh, the, the introduction and for the invitation to be here, and uh, also for the book plug. And uh, just a little subliminal reminder <coughs> as we go through the uh, presentation. What I would like to do uh, this morning is cover three areas of surface transportation that are common to both states, and, or all states. Uh, and we're going to start, the first one is the very difficult financial and budgetary issue that all states, and particularly the federal program, is mired in. And I don't see any solution in the near-term horizon. So what we're looking at for the future is restrained, constrained financial resources in the area of surface transportation. And as long, at least at the federal level, which provides about one-third of the money <coughs> that you use in your state or in states in, in average, uh, is going to be more constrained than anybody, plus they're stuck with this seemingly endless uh, uh, a budget conflict, which seems to have no resolution, whether it's sequester or shut, shutdowns. Uh, we, uh, we can't really look to any future there. Uh, the second thing I want to do is recognizing uh, that there's very l not much more you can spend without raising taxes and that there's very little sympathy to raise taxes uh, in both the state and at the federal level. Uh, the question is, where are we going to get the money? So the second part I'm going to talk about is some innovative solutions for drawing money from the private sector uh, or, or money uh, to road building that does not involve taxation or a very limited amount of taxation or allows you to leverage substantially taxation. And the third part is to talk about <coughs> the um, 
opportunities for spending the money that you do have in a much more efficient way, not so much in avoiding cost overruns, but to get the best impact or the most impact in terms of uh, congestion relief. And, and Bob pointed out in his poll that congestion relief or how much time you're spending in traffic seems to be the most uh, irritating factor of traffic problems among the people that were polled. Uh, now, so we're going to move in. As we can see, this is fairly grim. And so we're saying, well, how do we resolve this uh, without relying too much on the existing institutional uh, structure of the system? And uh, the person that, that sort of gave us some guidance, uh, and he didn't think he was giving us guidance, was uh, the, probably the America's most famous comedian uh, of the 1920s, Will Rogers. And what was a joke back then, the simple solution, have the government build cars and the private sector build roads, that meant we'll get more roads and less cars. Well, little did we, I, and I've been using this for years in my writing, but little did I know that it would actually come true, especially that the government's now building cars <coughs> uh, with its ownership stake, first in GM, and, and I think continuing in, in Chrysler today. But importantly, on the good side, we now have the private sector getting increasingly involved in building and funding roads. <laughs> now, what I'm going to do in the presentation is sort of weave together things that are going in Washington state and things that are going in my state, which I'm far more familiar with intimately. Uh, uh, and, and, it's, and it's not really contrived because many of the innovations that we are implementing in, in Virginia actually had their origins in Washington state. Uh, yet, while Washington state created these innovations and actually did some legislation and studies, uh, what they haven't done is really fully implemented them. Uh, but we've learned from that. I mean, your two major uh, uh, things that, that I'm going to talk about today are public-private partnerships go back to uh, 1993 when the state passed legislation. Uh, and you had the IG's uh, study of the congestion and congestion relief solution for uh, the Seattle metropolitan area in 1997. And uh, <laughs> I've been very enthusiastic about both, both, both of these, and as have other people, and we're now beginning to implement them in Virginia. And just going back to the obstacles here is that the, your, private, your Public Private Initiatives Act uh, started out with great promise, but it was continually or s several times amended to sort of narrow the focus and, and weaken the thrust. And then there was a, a court ruling, I think, on the Tacoma Bridge that essentially forced it to go from a from a, from a private initiative to essentially a fully funded uh, 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 a state uh, program. <laughs> and then uh, the IG's congestion mitigation program for the Seattle-Tacoma region, region found that with current budget projections, if they simply spent the money differently, you could have a 10 to 15 percent reduction in, uh, in, in, uh, in, in congestion uh, simply by doing a better job of of, of picking your projects. Now in Virginia, what we did was we've had our, uh, at the bottom, we had our, passed our Public Private Transportation Act in 1995, two years after yours. And in part, that was inspired by yours, but it was also inspired by kind of a one-off project that began in 1998, and that's the Dulles Greenway, which is a wholly private road, completely private, no no state money, no federal money in it. And it extended, went from Dulles Airport into the fast-growing western suburbs. And uh, suddenly the legislature looked at that and said, wait a minute, if we get the private sector to do this without really having a, a strong uh, legislative uh, 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 base to facilitate that, think of what we could do if we actually passed formal laws to encourage that. And that's why we passed the 1995 Act. And it's been fairly successful. Uh, right now we have three projects. One's just complete. These are major projects. Uh, just, uh, one's just been completed. Uh, and uh, it's been open for, for actually, this is, I, I miswrote myself there. It's actually been open for about a year. It's having its anniversary this week. Uh, <coughs> these, are hot, these are hot lanes on our beltway. Uh, and I'll go into a little bit more detail. Uh, I-95 hot lanes, which are underway, and the Portsmouth Tunnel, uh, which is in the North Norfolk area, uh, which is also underway. And, and all of these are taking place in heavily congested parts of the state. The first two are in Northern Virginia, and the second one is our major metropolitan area uh, in the southeast corner where the huge naval base is. Now, what's interesting about this is these represent all combined 
uh, $5 billion in infrastructure spending. Yet the tax contribution to this, the state's contribution to this, is only $1 billion. So we have taken $1 billion and levered that four times up to $5 billion. <laughs> now, the, the hot lanes, we have 14 miles of, of new four-lane highway, cost us $2 billion, opened uh, a year ago. And uh, you see about, about four, $400 million from the state of Virginia, this is taxpayer money, about, uh, about $1.2 billion in different types of loans, uh, and which the state is not obligated for. If, if a project fails, the, the Virginia taxpayers don't have to pay for this. <laughs> and $350 million from the equity partners, which is Transurban, uh, an Australian firm, and Floor Corporation, a U.S. firm, which combined to form the partnership that's building the road. And also, importantly, when it opened, it opened on time and within budget. There are no cost overruns there when the private sector was completely managing it. <laughs> Underway now is our other hot lanes, and hot lanes, for those of you who might not know, are high occupancy toll lanes. And what we're doing here is converting and extending an existing HOV lane, which connects the northern Virginia and Washington, D.C. Uh, uh, commercial and, and employment area with the southern uh, suburbs, which extend about 50 miles south of, uh, of the city. Uh, this is costing about a billion dollars. Uh, the contribution from Virginia is fairly negligible, only, only $67 million. Uh, the other contribution is, is the asset, the existing asset that they're providing, the existing HOV lanes that are being improved, and about uh, $700 million worth of loans, again, loans that the state and the state taxpayers will never be obligated for. <coughs> and the, the final uh, big project that's also underway, a little bit more controversial than the other ones. I might add that the other ones had bipartisan support. It, you know, it took them about 12 years to get off the ground with all the negotiating, but this goes through Democratic-controlled legislatures, Democratic governors, Republican governors, and so on, and everybody was enthusiastic for these projects. The difference is that this one was the first one that actually came up with a political roadblock once it was started. And the reason for that is the second line, and that it, it was funded by tolls on the new tunnel, but, and the re-imposition of tolls that are indexed to the rate of inflation on existing tunnels. Now, those existing tunnels were built, and let me just show you the situation there. I'll, the color doesn't come up as well as I had hoped, but, the Norfolk area is, is, is bisected by three rivers, the Atlantic Ocean and the Chesapeake Bay. And what you have is kind of a star-shaped uh, 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 body of water, and on each of the, the, the stars coming out on peninsulas are, are a variety of different cities. And the people commute back and forth. Some people live in Portsmouth and work in, in, in Norfolk or, or, or work in in Hampton and, and, and live in Portsmouth. <laughs> and so there's a lot of shuffling back and forth. And because there's a huge naval base, you can't have bridges because bridge would have to, you couldn't have a bridge high enough to allow an aircraft carrier to come under. So everything is tunnels. So the, this was a new tunnel and the, and the, and the, uh, the, 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 the congestion has, is just horrible in, in this area. And, and since they hadn't built a new tunnel in this area since the 1960s, there was, there was a thought to, to do one. <laughs> but as I pointed out in the, in the preceding uh, uh, one, the cost of the tunnel is about $2 billion. And the state simply didn't have the money for it. And so they finally put together a public-private partnership uh, with, I think, Skanska and, uh, and a domestic partner to, to put the deal together. And it was underway, and unfortunately, a, a lawsuit, or temporarily, unfortunately, there was a lawsuit from the local community saying that, well, it's really unfair to, to put tolls on tunnels that already exist so that people who will, will then be paying for something that they're not using. Uh, and the argument was, well, look, we're relieving uh, some congestion. And so, you know, even though you won't be using the new tunnel, you'll benefit from the fact that other people will. Well, nobody really cared that. People were simply looking at the fact that, you know, they're, they're, you, you were, some people who are commuting across these tunnels now saw that their toll, their commute bill would be added, would be increased by $1,000 a year as a result of the tolls. <laughs> so the, they, they sued and they won in the circuit court. And um, the, uh, <laughs> and as I said, the unique issues were, unlike the other ones where you do pay a toll, the toll is on 
new roads and you still have the free roads. Uh, so the only people that pay the toll are the people that want the premium service. In this case, whether you wanted the premium service or not, you still had to pay a substantial toll. That became very controversial, and the issues were, were constitutional in nature, and I don't know how these things would apply here, but it's, it's a lesson to what you can get away with and what you can't. Court ruled that it's a, it's a tax, not a fee, and, it's t and the state legislature did not have the right constitutionally to allow a private partnership to collect a tax, and uh, went to the Supreme Court, and the Supreme Court ruled uh, uh, against the circuit court, and so the, the, the project is now proceeding. Uh, and as I said, it's a $2 billion, actually a $2.1 billion project, and it's fairly ambitious. <coughs> and in fact, if the, if the court, Supreme Court had concurred with the circuit court, I think that would have been the end of P3s in, in Virginia, because it would just be perceived as simply too risky, uh, politically risky to do this. Now, while there are very impressive aspects to this, particularly the amount of money you can raise. The question is, will, will there be more opportunities for this and will we see more and more of this going on? Now, in addition to the political opposition to tolls, which you see here in your own state, uh, some of these toll roads have not done particularly well. Uh, as, as a business, they have been, had fairly, me some of them have had mediocre results. Some of them have had, had truly disastrous results. Uh, Dulles Greenway, which was the completely private one, is still in operation, uh, still serving a lot of uh, members of the community, a vital uh, 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 commut commuting road in Northern Virginia. <laughs> Yet what, you're, uh, what has happened is it's never really done well financially. It's never gone bankrupt, and it's survived by a variety of financial restructurings. <laughs> and in order to stay, meet debt, service payments, it has continually had to raise the tolls. As inflation rises, as maintenance need rise, rise it's had to raise tolls. <laughs> and the consequence is that it's irritating the community and the political establishment is turning against it. And, and these are Republicans. One wants to nationalize it or essentially statize it, have the state buy it, and then freeze tolls in perpetuity. So there, there goes the private sector. Uh, so there's renewed opposition. The Pocah Pocahontas Parkway in Richmond uh, is basically going bankrupt. It's never had the ridership necessary to cover its debt service. Uh, Transurban, the Australian infrastructure company, thought that, well, if we took it over, we can fix it up. We're the experts in this. So they bought it from the state. So the state and its investors never lost any money. <laughs> but they couldn't make a go at it. And they finally walked away from it. Uh, this year, uh, leaving uh, $300 million worth of debt on the hook, essentially wiped out. Uh, some people argue that fortunately it was mostly European money, so it didn't hurt us. And we, have, we still have the road. So this is a nice thing about it. I mean, if it fails, the, the taxpayer doesn't have to cover these things. <laughs> the I-495 hot lanes, which, uh, Bob, you saw them, right? You were on a tour. Very impressive. I mean, in addition to uh, you know, about 12 miles of, of new four-lane roads built in the median. Uh, they also built about, had to build about 20 new bridges over the whole, whole, uh, whole section of the Beltway. Now, the financial documents that were used to raise the money project what revenues were and to justify saying, here's what, here's what our ridership will be. This implies a certain amount of revenues, and thus we can cover the debt. However, it turns out that it's been open for a year, and the, the, the September quarter uh, reported that the average ridership, average rider daily ship, uh, <coughs> excuse me, the daily ridership was on average a little under 40,000. And that the peak ridership recorded on any given day was 47,000. Now the 47,000 is 20,000 less than what the expectation was for average ridership. So nobody has sort of put this into, well, what are the implications here for, for servicing the $1.2 billion worth of debt? So, you know, the question is, will there be improvements? Will people get used to it? Will they enjoy the premium service? Will they be willing to pay for it? As the economy improves, will more people be on the road, more people have jobs, commuting, and so on? We don't know, but we've got our fingers crossed, because if that doesn't work, I don't think we'll ever see another one, <laughs> and that, that could, could hurt the, uh, the, the whole market. Uh, around the country for, for doing P3s. Uh, and uh, there are only a couple, couple of, of, of states now that actually have 
a comedate of walls uh, to do this, Texas being one, and Texas is also going gangbusters with uh, P3s, and I think uh, Colorado is as well. <laughs> now, let me go back to how to spend your money more wisely. Uh, I was very impressed with the, uh, with the, the Washington's, uh, the IG's effort to come up with a program to mitigate congestion by picking projects more smartly. And I, I've always been in close communication with the Washington Policy Center, and so um, I was in, in getting information from them, and I ended up having on this innovative project that they had. And at the Heritage Foundation in 1998, I held a forum where I brought in a whole bunch of uh, uh, transportation experts uh, from, from states and, and the federal government and the private sector to hear a presentation from, from the consultants who had actually done the project for the Inspector General. And they gave what I thought was a very upbeat uh, presentation, and I began writing on it, and I published some work by Michael Ennis at the, uh, at the Washington Policy Center through the Heritage Foundation, <coughs> and I began trying to influence my own state. And so uh, I was a adv transportation advisor to the current governor, uh, when he was running for office, and uh, he uh, actually made this part of his campaign. And in 2012, uh, the state legislator passed the law that allowed for performance-based measurements of projects uh, just for the Northern Virginia area, which is one of the most congested in the country. And more recently, even though that was just enacted but not implemented, the Speaker of the House of Delegates in Virginia, who's probably the second most powerful political official in Virginia, has announced that he would like to see that expanded to all of the state and, and intends at the next legislative, legislative session to introduce legislation to do that. Uh, and it, it's fair, fairly simple. Uh, it's, it, essentially, the, the key thing is that, it ha is that we pick projects according to a quantitative measuring system on the, <coughs> on the uh, extent to which it will reduce congestion based on our best modeling. And so uh, you don't have all these extraneous things like uh, safety and environmental stuff and creating jobs and so on and so on. <coughs> so it's fairly clean. Uh, the the, the uh, uh, state DOT is now tasked with evaluating this, picking the taking in the 12, 25 most important projects for Northern Virginia, coming up with a quantitative measuring system, and by the end of next year is supposed to report its findings. Now, there are a couple of weaknesses in there. One, politically, no transit program will, will ever survive something like this. They just don't reduce congestion. People think they do, but the analysis by any respectable transportation expert and civil engineer concludes otherwise. Um, so transit has a lot of political juice behind it. Uh, how honest will the rating system will be? You know, there's a lot of pressure because essentially you're taking the decision making on projects potentially away from the state legislature, uh, politicians, elected officials, and the leadership of VDOT, who now get to pick all these things. Um, the other weakness is that, at least as currently written, once you come up with this rating system, there's no requirement that you actually have to do it. But at least you have it out there and you can have a public debate on it. And then the fourth thing is we've just had a governor's race. Uh, the Republic, conservative Republican lost to a friend of the Clintons, Terry McAuliffe. And the question is how he'll be now running VDOT, where his people would be running VDOT, so they'll be doing this study. So the question is how honest will this be? How enthusiastic will he be? Because you generally find, at least in our state, the Democrats are sort of anti-car sort of anti and kind of pro-transit and stuff like that. And anybody who looks at the system will know that this is very much of a pro-car thing. <laughs> but anyway, the, uh, the Speaker of the House has come up with one. Uh, he, has three pro he has three goals for, for projects. One is congestion relief, exactly like the other one. Uh, the, 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 the second one is safety, and the third one is economic development, which could become kind of fuzzy. And that's the end. Right, on time. 30 seconds ago, I have the big one came up. So,